Thank you very much. Um, I'm really lucky to be going after a lot of great talks today, and I wanted to take a moment to reflect on those talks um, and, and uh, say some positive things about them, um, not only because they were great talks and uh, I don't really have much to criticize, but also because I don't want to get tossed off of a yacht later in the after party. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I did want to say something about those, uh, those discussions where um, Dr. Nick started off this morning um, talking about how the tools that we're using often shape the, uh, the concepts that we have about our, our applications. Um, and Matt Wynn talking about uh, hexagonal rails and, and how that can be a pattern to help us structure our applications in a, a better and, and more sustainable way. Um, and Francis doing a great job of talking about um, values in our community um, in the context of uh, front-end and uh, back-end applications um, and, and how we, we have a lot of uh, core community values that, that really hold us together. And one of those values, I think, um, is, is related to testing. Um, in, in the Rails community, we, we really have a, a commitment to spending quite a bit of time uh, testing our applications. Um, and it's, it's so much different from a decade ago when I was working in a, a Perl uh, programming shop. I'll, I'll admit to doing that. Um, and the, uh, it was a, a company that was pushing millions of dollars in transactions through a system. Uh, and I actually got strange looks when I asked to see the test suite. Um, it just wasn't something that people were doing. Um, and in Ruby, we've really done such a great job of, of coming to a different position in, in our testing. Um, and at the same time, I, I feel like there's, there's a lot more that we can do. And that's really what this talk is about. The talks earlier today focused very much on, on the values that we have and, and the way that we um, uh, have built up a lot of great tools, but, but also how we can adapt those and, and how much farther we can go. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about uh, testing recently, and we've spoken specifically about uh, concepts um, that relate to test coverage. How much should we test? Uh, should we cover something or should we not cover it? And so we've, we've spoken about things in the last few years, uh, concepts like TATFT, um, uh, DHH, the creator of Ruby on Rails, has been vocal about, uh, certain cons uh, about uh, a certain level of test coverage, and I'll go into that. Um, and people like Kent Beck have also spoken about what they feel comfortable testing and what they don't want to test. Um, so TATFT, if you haven't seen this acronym before, uh, stands for test all the effing time. Uh, this is a G-rated talk, so I I'll uh, leave the looking up of the rest of it to, to the um, listeners of this talk. Um, and I think that there are some merits to this, especially coming from a context where we may not be testing everything in our applications. Um, if you're not doing any testing, then maybe TATFT is, is not a bad way to start. Um, but it also has certain limitations. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, specifically, I've, I've heard things from our own developers at uh, Stack Builders, um, where I'm a consultant. And people will say things like, we have uh, like a 1 to 2.2 code to test ratio, and I still sometimes don't feel confidence enough. In, in what we have in our, in our uh, test coverage. And this is really disappointing because I feel like we're spending a lot of resources here and we're still not coming up with a tool that, uh, that really helps us out in our development as much as we could. Um, DHH uh, is, is very vocal about, in one of his blog posts called Testing Like the TSA, um, about how much we should aim for, for in terms of our test coverage. And he said, don't aim for 100% test coverage. He says that uh, code to test ratios above uh, one to two is a smell, um, above one to three is a stink. And he says, you're probably doing it wrong if testing is taking more than a third of your time. You're definitely doing it wrong if it's taking up more than half. Um, I think that in terms of both of these uh, coverage issues, TATFT or the, the things that DHH is talking about in terms of coverage, they're not meant to be taken at face value. Clearly, there are types of applications that don't fit into these, uh, these amounts of coverage. And we don't want to, uh, uh, to say that you know, this is an absolute truth about the amount of coverage that we should shoot for. Kent Beck, uh, who has written a lot about test-driven development and was one of the uh, foremost advocates for, for doing TDD, says, I get paid for code that works, not for tests. So my philosophy is to test as little as possible to reach a given level of confidence. Uh, 
And he says, I suspect this level of confidence is high compared to industry standards, but that could just be hubris. Now, at this point, we're moving towards something that is not as quantitative as the other approaches, not as quantitative as TATFT, um, and it's, uh, it's certainly a subjective thing, too. So Kent Beck is saying that a level of testing that's appropriate for me might not be appropriate for someone else. Uh, and so that's certainly a, a different direction from the other approaches that try to be uh, sort of universal mandates for a certain kind of coverage. Um, but I still feel that we can go farther than this. And specifically, what I want to do is, is go beyond talking about uh, strictly coverage, which I feel like we do a lot in the context of testing, and instead talk about uh, different patterns and, and ways of shaping our test suite uh, so that it, it becomes easier to work with. And we have lots of ways, lots of concepts uh, that are useful for talking about uh, shapes of production code. We have things like dry, uh, don't repeat yourself, we have solid, uh, and we have lots of different design patterns. Um, and despite what uh, people like DHH say about uh, how design patterns can lead to a, a certain sort of uh, pollution of your application if, if carried too far, um, you know, they, they are still useful in, in trying to, to figure out a beneficial shape of an application or in trying to articulate what's wrong with a certain application that's become difficult to work with. Um, and, and despite this, you know, we're, we're still kind of staying at the quantitative level um, with, with a lot of our uh, talk about testing. So uh, in, in shifting this discussion, uh, and, and I'm not the first one to do this, but I think that it's, it's still useful um, since this is something that I found is useful in a lot of our client projects. I want to talk about um, some concepts that we can mobilize to help make our applications more habitable. And uh, habitability isn't a, a new concept with software either. And in fact, there is a, a book by Richard Gabriel uh, called Patterns of Software, Tales from the Software Community. And he says, habitability is one of the most important characteristics of software. It enables developers to live comfortably in and repair or modify existing code and design. And I think that this is really something that we can shoot for not just in production code, um, but with our, our test coverage as well. Uh, like I said, there are lots of cases that I've seen where we have a high degree of coverage and a low level of comfort, um, or also, of course, uh, a very sparse uh, test coverage and, and little comfort there too. Um, so what I want to do is, is build concepts in order to, um, uh, to move us forward in, in uh, organizing our tests in better ways to make them more habitable. And I want to think about uh, what concepts we have right now. And I think that it's, it's important to realize um, that the, the concepts that we have about test coverage are always going to shape uh, the, uh, the, the, way that they, um, the way that they're written. And uh, Dr. Nick mentioned earlier that um, the, the tools that we have shape the way that we think. But there's also a, a concept that we have that, that shapes the tools, right? Uh, every single tool that we use uh, has a certain kind of concept that, uh, that has been behind the, uh, the design of that tool. And, and then that in turn affects the way that other people are using it and the concepts they have about their code. Um, and, and in the context of development, we focus so much on this notion of coverage that a lot of times that's our concept. You know, we need a test here, we don't need a test here. Um, so going beyond this, I've, I've thought about uh, a notion of Cupid, and I think that we need to show our tests some love. And so in the tradition of um, things like SOLID, I'm, I'm trying to create an acronym uh, with concepts that uh, aren't entirely my own, but which I think are useful in, in creating uh, sensible tests. Uh, so I'm going to go over the acronym first, and then I'm going to go over some examples um, before we open up the floor to discussion. The first uh, part of the acronym that I want to discuss is C, and uh, uh, this stands for consistent distance. And so in our test suites, we have things that we call acceptance tests um, that, we, that are often end-to-end -end, uh, and integrative. And in these tests, we don't want to stub. Um, they should be uh, interacting with the system like a user would. So that could be clicking around in a browser, uh, clicking around in a graphical user interface. Um, and that's the way that, they, uh, that we should be interacting with the system. We also have unit tests, which try to isolate a specific module or class that is under test. 
Um, and the goal of this in a book uh, that uh, Matt referenced earlier called um, Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests, or the Goose Book, as you refer to it, um, and I'm not going to go into that uh, too much in, in this presentation because he already talked about it some and because it sounds a lot better when it's done with a Scottish accent. Um, but uh, I, I think that it has a lot of great ideas. And one of the things that uh, Matt called out is that it talks about the fact that the important thing is not so much the context of our classes, but the relationships they have with other classes. And with our unit tests, this is very much what we want to um, But the notion of consistent distance uh, being carried further, I think, means that in things like acceptance tests, we shouldn't be going under the covers and doing you know, things like book, um, but still I see a lot of this happening, uh, especially with, uh, with tools like VCR. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. I, I think that largely our tests should be unstubbed, and part of this relates to making the dependencies of our classes explicit. Going back to this concept in, in the Goose book of um, driving out the relationships between classes. And uh, I think that when you use things like mock objects, instead of stubbing things on a, a particular class, uh, these relationships become a lot more clear. Um, there's a, a kind of a, an addition to this rule uh, that says that you shouldn't stub anything that isn't yours. Um, and I think that, that also goes under this concept of um, trying to make your tests unstubbed. Uh, your test should be pyramidal. And uh, this is something that uh, Brian Helmkamp mentioned um, when he was uh, writing something about this presentation, he said that I should mention the test pyramid. And uh, I think that's a really great suggestion. And this, this certainly does uh, help to, to clear up a lot of confusion about, about test suites. And I've seen that um, in a lot of test suites, in, instead of, uh, let, me, let me describe the, uh, the pyramid first. So if you can read this text, up at the top, it says end-to-end uh, -end acceptance testing. And so this should be like your, your feature tests. Um, and tests at that level that relate to your system by the, um, by the interfaces. So by the uh, graphical user interface, by a web browser, um, and on the other side, uh, in terms of the services that you're connecting to. Below that, you have the integrated subset tests, which is trying out uh, a certain collection of the objects in your system in relationship to each other. And down in the foundation of the pyramid, you have the unit tests. And the unit tests, uh, it's very important to emphasize um, are the, the foundation of the pyramid. So there should, be, there should be more unit tests proportionately to the tests that you have um, at the acceptance level. And if you look at most of the books on, on testing, they'll talk about this testing cycle. And I think that a lot of us are doing this, but um, with the focus on, on BDD and, and doing things at the acceptance level, I think that maybe some of the gist of it might be getting lost. Um, you should generally be writing something like an acceptance test first, and then iterating on a, and then watching that fail, and then iterating on a feature um, primarily by creating unit tests um, until you reach a point where the acceptance test is passing. And if you do that, you'll almost naturally have a, a sort of a distribution like this, where you created your one acceptance test, and you created a bunch of lower level tests to support that. Um, and that's going to help you in a bunch of different ways. The, the acceptance tests are generally very slow because they're fully integrative. Um, and, and they're also less specific. So if you get a failure at an acceptance test, how do you figure out where that is? You oftentimes look at a, a red dot on the screen and you say, well, that's great. It's either in this component or you know, maybe 12 levels down, right? Um, and, and that's kind of a, a painful thing to dig through a lot of times. So in, in contrast to just using these acceptance tests uh, and having a high degree of acceptance tests, um, you try to create unit, unit tests for more of a specificity of, of diagnosis of um, error conditions. Uh, your test should be idempotent. Um, so they should always pass regardless of order. Um, and your test should also not have side effects. Uh, now, this is, uh, this is something, uh, idempotency is something that's important in computer science and, and very important in testing. And I think that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to it, even though RSpec has, uh, in the current versions at least, a really useful feature, uh, which is dash dash random. And if you turn this on, it's going to run your tests in a different order on each run. And in my experience at least, um, I found that 
every significantly sized project that hasn't been using dash dash random is going to have one or two failures that occur when you start running with this flag turned on. Um, so uh, go and try to prove me wrong. Uh, if you've got a test suite that isn't doing this, um, go, uh, go and try to run it with a dash dash random flag and uh, um, you know, tweet to me about, about your results. Um, but I have found that it is a really good tool to figure out where you have uh, tests that are dependent on a uh, state that was changed in, in another test. Your test should always also be distinct. And I think that uh, in, in doing test-driven development, a lot of us end up writing more and more tests, but it takes a, a much more mature vision into the, the software that you've written to actually go back and delete some, right? Um, and, and so we should see how much behavior you're testing uh, in unit tests and integration tests and choose one of those. And I would say that most often, the, the tests should be focusing on the, uh, the unit test level. Right? So if you have a choice between testing something integrationally and testing something at the unit test level, uh, choose the cheaper option. And, and that's going to be unit tests. Uh, so don't be, don't be afraid to, uh, to delete tests. Um, and, and try to, uh, to figure out how many things fail when you change one piece of code. Um, it's really depressing to see a lot of stuff go. So let's review these concepts for a second. Um, we, uh, we talked about a notion of consistent distance in our tests. Uh, we talked about your test being unstubbed. We talked about the test being uh, pyramidal in form. And uh, we talked about the test being idempotent and distinct. And these aren't supposed to be uh, upheld as some kind of a universal truth. Uh, but they are things that, that I found when I, when I consider the, the way that I'm looking at a test suite and trying to figure out how useful it is. Um, and also when I'm trying to identify why a certain test suite feels like it's burdensome rather than helpful. Uh, these are some of the concepts that I mobilized to, to articulate that. Um, and as uh, software engineers, that's, that's a big part of our responsibility, to not just be able to say, well, that sucks and, and we shouldn't do it that way, but to actually have terms to articulate um, why a certain thing is not easy to solve or why a certain um, set of tools are, are not useful. So uh, after we've presented those, uh, those concepts, I want to talk about how we can leverage this in, in specific code samples. Um, and the first thing that I wanted to talk about is the, the violation of, of consistent distance. Um, and so I said that the first thing that we want to look for is keeping consistent distance. So unit tests should uh, isolate a class under test, um, and they should substitute mocks probably for, for close neighbors. Um, and acceptance tests should be end-to-end. -end. So you can manipulate the input into them as a user would, and you shouldn't really be stubbing things under the covers until it comes out the other side, which could be talking to a service or whatever. Um, now, with that said, why is it okay to use something like VCR? Um, and this is something that I've struggled with in a lot of projects. And uh, so if you haven't seen it, VCR is a tool that allows you to stub HTTP responses in an application. Um, and VCR is well written and everything, but I, I often run into a lot of pain in projects that are using this. Um, and it took me a while to, to think about why this is. And I think that one of the ways that we can understand the, the pain that we're experiencing, or at least that I have in, in projects that I've worked on when using a tool like this, is because it violates a, a principle of um, uh, consistent distance. You've, on the one side, perhaps got an application test where you're running Selenium, um, and you're clicking things in the web browser, uh, you're doing stuff in a graphical user interface. Um, and on the other side, what's happening here? You've, you've used this tool that replaces the other end of your application uh, with a black box. And this, to me, is, is not doing uh, this end-to-end -end testing. Um, if you actually have a problem and you have to look up uh, what's on the other side um, with the, uh, the canned responses, you end up looking through YAML files and uh, encoded HTML inside of that. Um, and, and that can be difficult to work with. Um, so what's an alternative to this? Uh, VCR is a stubbing tool, and as I've said, I, I don't think that stubbing belongs in end-to-end acceptance tests. Um, it's better to have specific tests that connect to external endpoints or to provide a fake service. Um, so this is something that we started doing internally at uh, Stack Builders, and I later on found um, that somebody at Pivotal was doing something very similar, and they wrote a blog post about it um, with a, a code snippet they used. You can set up your own fake service. 
Um, so instead of just using VCR, which might leverage a library to knock out methods in, in net HTTP, um, you, can, you can actually use, uh, you can do something a little bit more sophisticated, I think, where you basically start up a fake service of your own. Um, so there's nothing to prevent you from using a Ruby thread and starting up a rack server uh, with a Sinatra application or something that, that makes your external dependency entirely explicit. And although this isn't going to be a replacement for the real thing, um, it's not a stub either. And you definitely know what this uh, external service is doing if you've written it yourself. Um, now, this might sound like a bit more work, and it certainly can be, but in a sense, VCR feels to me like cheating. Um, and, and you're basically recording these sessions, and, and you have them appear uh, invisibly in your application. Um, and the alternative that I'm pro proposing here is not creating a fully-fledged sandbox with um, all of the uh, uh, state-maintaining features of, of an API like Google AdWords, but just creating something that um, preserves enough of the semantics uh, and the, the API syntax to, to get you through um, and to make you believe that it's a real thing for most cases. You usually don't even have to save state in it. So, so this is a, a packaged version of what we came up with um, on my uh, GitHub repository called Shamrock. Um, with the emphasis on the sham because it's a, uh, a thing for fake services. Um, so uh, this is uh, the second problem that I wanted to talk about is with uh, stubbing instead of mocking. And in this example, um, and I'm very sorry about the, uh, the low contrast between a couple of those colors there, um, but basically uh, what's happening here is that you have a, uh, a class that you're, you're passing, a balance calculator class, and internally it's going and it's retrieving a few accounts um, and on those accounts, it's going to calculate the balance. Um, these two lines here are doing stubs uh, where you're saying, don't actually call that method, um, just return a few hard-coded accounts. Um, and then you're saying the balance should be uh, $30 or whatever. Um, now, this is, uh, I, I think, an overuse of stubbing. Um, these methods, like retrieve account info and retrieve account type, um, may actually be private methods, in which case you shouldn't touch them, right? Um, if you do, you're breaking the encapsulation of the class, which you don't have a right to do in your application code, and which you shouldn't be doing in your test code, um, because your test should be making explicit the, uh, the external dependencies of your, of your class and the way that it should be called. Um, and uh, so we can think about some other options of, of doing this instead of just stubbing out the, the methods inside of the class. Maybe we can pass the accounts to the initializer or something like that. Um, but oftentimes what we want to do is to use mock objects instead. And so I think that uh, mock objects are, are really underused, especially when we've got great frameworks like uh, RSpec that make things like stubbing and, and mocking on um, existing classes so easy. Um, and you, know, you don't find bugs with those anymore. Um, and they really help out to uh, to just stub you know, a certain method on a particular class. But the benefit, which is using a mock object, um, is that you can be very explicit about all the methods that it responds to. And you can say this is exactly um, the kind of interface that the, uh, the classes you're passing to this thing should have. Um, so I, I think that uh, stubbing leads to, can lead to complex test setup. Um, and it doesn't help you to make your dependencies explicit enough. Um, the, the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, uh, stubbing things that you don't own, right? And I mentioned that you shouldn't uh, stub things that you don't own. And this is an example of that. This is actually from Shamrock, uh, the utility that I mentioned to use fake services instead of using something like VCR, which just uh, stubs out HTTP responses. And as I said, it basically just starts a rack application that is going to um, uh, be in a separate Ruby thread, and your test suite is just going to, your application is going to call that other thread um, as your tests run. And so this is all it takes. Uh, you do a thread new, and you say a rack handler, or web brick, or mongrel, or whatever, and you say run uh, with a rack application that you give it. And if you haven't created a rack application before, it's very simple. It's just something that responds to call. So it can be a proc, and then you return back um, some kind of a response. And, and so that's all there is to it. And that can be a Sinatra app, too, or something. Um, and uh, so the, the problem here is, what do you do if you're going to uh, try to run this in a test? 
uh, all of a sudden you've got a stub, like you can stub rack handler web brick dot run, right? You can do rack handler web brick uh, dot stub run and return whatever. Um, and it makes the, the test a little bit stranger to write. And you're also coupling to a specific implementation of an external dependency. Um, so what can you do instead of this? Uh, one of the things that you can, uh, you can certainly do is to use dependency injection. And this is something that people talked about maybe a lot more in Java because it was tougher to do there. And you needed to have things like um, uh, frameworks to, to help out with this. Um, but instead of stubbing the rack handler web brick, you can just pass it into the initializer, right? And that way, one of the benefits is that your tests become, uh, it's much easier to use a mock object in your test rather than having to stub something that isn't yours. Another side benefit is that your code becomes less coupled and it makes it much easier for somebody else using your library to pass in a different kind of handler if they need to. So don't be scared of dependency injection and it helps out in a lot of cases, especially in testing. You can provide defaults, so you don't even have to affect the uh, signature that a lot of other callers of your class use. Um, and, and I found that I'm using this more and more as I write more Ruby. Um, and uh, so I think that in particular, this is better for harder dependencies of your class. So if you have something like a, a web handler, an HTTP handler, um, try using this to, to see if it uh, reduces the coupling. Another problem that I've seen uh, relates to the, uh, the test pyramid. And we, we talked about the, uh, the ideal test pyramid shape being the end-to-end -end acceptance test at the top um, in, in a smaller proportion to the unit test on the bottom uh, forming the base. And what I see in, in uh, recent test suites that I've looked at in a lot of different RALS projects is quite the opposite. You see a high proportion of end-to-end -end acceptance tests which run, run really slowly. Um, I've talked to lots of people who have test suites that run two hours, two and a half hours, um, and uh, you know that, that frequently happens. And, and I don't see too many RELS projects that have test suites that run in less than 20, 25 minutes. Um, you know, that seems to be a, a pretty common uh, uh, figure that I've seen across some kind of you know, medium, smaller size RELS apps. Um, and uh, so, so this is really problematic. And it's hard to say exactly why this is happening. Um, maybe it's because of uh, the fact that we're emphasizing things like BDD. So the, uh, the way that we think about testing is, as it should be, as a, a user of the system. So we're saying, as a user, I would like to you know, go to the front page of the site and log in. And that's kind of become our, our default language for talking about testing. And so we end up writing a lot of these, uh, these acceptance tests that, that take this shape and emphasizing those rather than unit tests that interact with the system at a lower level. Um, maybe it relates to the fact that JavaScript is hard to test integratively, as, uh, as people have mentioned in these talks today. And uh, it certainly is. You know, we've got things like Jasmine and other frameworks to test strictly the, the JavaScript compo component of our applications. But when we actually try to test that integratively, we don't really have a great way of doing that, except with something like Selenium and, and using our um, integrative test suites. Um, and, and so the, the end result is that a lot of times we end up getting stuck on this end-to-end uh, -end acceptance testing level and not getting enough unit tests. And this makes our tests run longer and longer, and it makes them less useful, because when something breaks, you don't know in what level that's occurring. Um, so the, the answer to this is to kind of reverse it and, and to say when you've got an option, make a unit test instead of an acceptance test and try to turn this around. Um, Non-idempotent tests. Uh, I've, I've seen this in a lot of test suites as well and as I mentioned, the, the cure for this is, is rather straightforward by using something like dash dash random, um, but it happens in a lot of cases. This is one that I actually found in a, a project that I worked on. Um, and it's hard to read, I'll just read it for you. It's only uh, one line. Uh, basically, in, in the middle of a, a test example, somewhere in you know, this probably 25 minute long test suite, somebody was calling um, action controller base uh, and they were setting the asset host to a different asset host to, to change something. And so this is a global setting um, at, at the, uh, in the RELS level. And so I was entirely perplexed about why um, halfway through the test suite on, in certain random orders, all of the subsequent tests would be fouling because the assets would not be loading. 
And I was like, what could this be? And uh, you know, finally, I did some kind of a, a binary regression or whatever and, and spent uh, way too long trying to, to track down this problem. And I found that a developer had, had just you know, stuck this in there in one example without realizing that it was causing side effects in, in a way that would, uh, that would be very difficult to trace down later. Um, so what you really want to do is, is emphasize things like uh, immutability in, in your test suite. Um, and uh, there, there are other languages that, uh, that do this a lot differently than, than Ruby. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, Clojure in my spare time and uh, not as much for client work. But uh, in a language like Clojure, it's going to make this harder to do, right? You've got to be very much more explicit about um, when you change a, a value that's, uh, that's global um, and that could affect uh, the results in other parts of your program. Um, and Ruby doesn't do that. Uh, it's, it, it takes uh, dynamic programming to um, uh, a very high degree and it gives you way more than enough rope to hang yourself with. Um, and uh, for better or for worse, that's, that's what we're dealing with. Um, and it's a great language, but uh, it, it puts more responsibility on the programmer. Um, and that's just one of the, the things that we, uh, that we deal with. We have to be more careful not to, uh, not to do things like this. Uh, another issue that, uh, that I mentioned is, is duplicate coverage. And I have a quote from one of the developers on our team, uh, Alexander de Oliveira. And he said, in a project that I worked on, one single bug caused 124 tests to fail. I was so perplexed that I couldn't figure out from which, bri uh, which bridge to jump from. <laughs> who's been in that situation? Who's, who's seen like, a, a single bug that just like, totally, um, totally blows your mind when you change one line of code and all of a sudden you've got a screen full of red, right? Uh, this, is, this is really demoralizing. And um, uh, instead of becoming a habitable environment, um, what we're finding is that the, uh, the tests really become hostile. Um, you know, they're not, they're not helping you anymore. They just make you not want to touch anything, <laughs> right? And, and this is exactly the, the wrong direction to go in. So uh, why, why is this whole testing thing so difficult? Um, we, uh, there's a, a quote that I found from uh, Gerald Sussman, who uh, is one of the, the original um, teachers from the uh, MIT SIGP course. And he said that uh, the world is messier in general. Uh, there are massive amounts of data floating around, and the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve are much sloppier, and the solutions a lot less discrete than they used to be. Um, and, and that's very much the case in, in production code uh, as well as in, in our application code. And so if you're working on something like Project Euler, you know, just solving these um, uh, discrete uh, problems in math without external integrations, um, unit tests are the easiest things to write, you know, and, and I couldn't think about doing exercises like that without creating unit tests because they just make me go faster. Um, but then you get into a world of, of mixing uh, JavaScript and, and uh, Ruby in applications, um, connecting to external services that you just want to wish away with uh, using something like VCR. Um, and uh, you have problems with all, all these uh, real world problems that just really complicate the, uh, the situation for, for your tests. Um, and uh, you know, the, so that's, that's uh, I think, one of the things that, that makes testing so difficult because you have all the problems of the integrations in production code um, and it's just amplified when you're actually trying to integrate against your code that's integrating against the rest of the world. So uh, going back to the, the book that uh, uh, Matt Wynn mentioned, um, and this is really a, a great resource, um, the, the fact that it's written with Java examples shouldn't hold you back from looking at it. Um, they're really not that uh, tough to approach. Um, they say in that book, we regularly reflect on how well TDD is working for us, identify any weaknesses, and adapt our, tr our testing strategy. And I really think that based on what I've seen in a lot of projects that I've worked on over the last few years, um, that we have a lot of great ideas in testing. And we have a community that is much more vocal and much more adamant about adhering to, to strong testing practices um, than perhaps in, in any other language. Um, and that's something that we can really be proud of. And I think it's really helped out the, the quality of our, our applications. Um, but I also think that we can improve it. And, and my suggestion for improving it is 
to think about different concepts rather than just strict coverage. You know, trying to mention something like Qubit, um, and if Qubit doesn't work, uh, throw that out and, and build different concepts. <clears throat> so in, in closing uh, this presentation, I just wanted to say that uh, sensible testing to me is reflexive. And in, in software, we build three kinds of tools. We build tools for our clients, we build these web applications, or we build these tools for our full-time employers. Um, we also build tools that help us to build these things. Um, and uh, that's the, the kind of tool, I guess, that, uh, that Dr. Nick was talking about with deployment earlier. Um, there are tools like RSpec or whatever we're using for writing our tests. Um, and, and we also build concepts. Um, and the, uh, the concepts that we build are what I've really tried to focus on in, in, this, uh, in this presentation. They're, they're not things to be held up as a, a sort of a platonic ideal. They're not things to be passed down from an ivory tower to say this is a blueprint for the way that you should write your application no matter what it does. Um, but they're thinking tools that we can adapt uh, in order to solve particular problems that we have. And uh, I, I think that uh, in, in closing, I just wanted to, to ask you what concepts you're mobilizing in, in your testing. And are they the ones that you're happy with, or, or can we improve them and change them? Thank you.